So, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to give Green Rands this morning. I'm going to talk about performance improvement uh, for the surgeon. The uh, it's hard to cover. It's har hard to cover performance improvement uh, in 35 minutes. The uh, American College of Surgeons just had its. Uh, uh, quality, I mean, it's still going on. I think today's the last day. Four days. Uh, four days of 10-hour uh, days. And uh, truthfully, if you intended the whole thing and were able to go to every uh, meeting, you would still have more to learn. So it's, uh, it's not a simple concept. But uh, for, for the residents, uh, I'm biased, but I, I believe you're in a great surgery residency. Uh, it's not great because of us. It's great for the because of the people who came before. And their philosophy was that you should be able to think your way through problems. Th that they couldn't tell you every single thing that you're going to see, but with a good education and training, you should be able to think your way through problems. So I'm going to try to give you that overview. I'm going to start with the history. I'm just going to kind of compare where uh, we are today compared to where we were in uh, 100 years ago. We'll talk about the problems of why performance improvement and quality should be super important to everyone in the audience. And I'm going to try to lay out a philosophy that uh, uh, will hold up over time. And I'll talk about the model for the uh, American College of Surgeons uh, quality improvement model and what we can do uh, to improve and reduce cost. This is my grandmother and my youngest daughter. Uh, my daughter in that picture just graduated from high school last month. Uh, but my grandmother was born in 1908. So to me, 1917 is not that long ago. It's palpable that somebody who I spent uh, half my life with was around in 1917. Well, 1917 was not a very good year, let me just say. The American College of Surgeons had been formed in 1913. The Texas Surgical Society had been formed two years later. There was a war in Mexico. U.S. troops uh, had essentially invaded Mexico and were pursuing Pancho Villa. In 1917, the United States formally entered World War I, declaring war against Germany. There were battles raging in Ramadi and Fallujah. The state of race relations in the U.S. Uh, this decade saw the resurgence of the Klan, and uh, lynching was common in Texas. There was a race riot in 1917 in St. Louis that left 250 people dead. And there was a riot in Houston of African-American soldiers 20 people were dead and 29 soldiers were executed. <laughs> Women did not yet have the right to vote. It wasn't until 1920. And a group of women suffragists were arrested in 1917 and beaten. The Bolshevik Revolution in Russia had just occurred in October. And Vladimir Lenin was in control of Russia. That same year, John F. Kennedy, Zsa, Zsa Gabor, John Conley would become governor of Texas. Ella Fitzgerald were born, and Buffalo Bill Cody died. So what was the story of improving surgical quality in 1917? The year before, Ernest Codman had written his study of hospital efficiency where he really 
advocated for the concept of actually measuring outcomes after surgery. That got him drummed out of a successful academic practice in Boston. Uh, but uh, the American College of Surgeons was an early adopter and felt that it was important to establish a hospital standardization program to improve hospital care. Uh, that became the Joint Commission in 1952 and has evolved into uh, the ACS quality programs. So what my grandmother would have been nine years old. What was it like to get hurt in 1917? If you had an open femur fracture, you had a 70% risk of death. And you would probably be permanently disabled if you survived. If you sustained a gunshot wound to the abdomen, so World War I was in full swing, and if you sustained a gunshot wound to the abdomen, you had a 90% risk of death. And if you had a 30% total body surface area burn, you had a 50% risk of dying. And for those of you who, who get outside the overdeveloped world to, to, to low and middle, middle income countries, you know that with these mortality rates, there was disability all around. That was what it was like when my grandmother was a child. So there's been a lot of progress made the past hundred years. Tremendous amount of progress that actually should be a uh, cause for high fives all around. If you think we're in a tumultuous political time in 2017, think about 1917. Much progress. So, what's the problem? What's the problem? Problem one. <clears throat> Between 50 and 100,000 people die each year from adverse outcomes in healthcare. We might argue whether those are errors or whether they're adverse outcomes, but the bottom line is there's still a lot of people who are unintentionally harmed in healthcare today. What's been the response? Public grading of hospitals, grading of physicians, grading of surgeons, healthcare reform modern pay for performance, MACRA and MIPS, which have already been discussed in, in this meeting in the past six months. But there's no question that whether that's 100,000 or whether it's 10,000, there's too many people who are harmed from health care. The second problem, this is a quote from, it's not my quote, this is a quote from The Economist. Regardless of where you stand on health care reform, regardless of whether you're Republican or whether you're Democrat, we do have a health care cost problem. This is U.S. national health expenditures as a percent of uh, GDP. Uh, in uh, 1960, it's about 6%. It's currently about 18%. Has it improved? Yes. Are young people to blame? No. So this looks at, this is my own attempt at taking this data and adjusting it for inflation. But this is national health care expenditures percent annual increase minus inflation. And you can see that the biggest, the biggest uh, difference when healthcare expenditures were out of proportion to inflation were the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And that actually, when adjusted for inflation, uh, healthcare costs are decreasing. So it's not like there's no progress being made. There, there is progress being made. But you can see it's never been below inflation. Never, not a single year. So 
So where does it come from? Where does it go? $3.2 trillion, $3.2 trillion for national health care expenditures in a year. 74% is made up of health insurance. A little bit more than half is governmental, Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, DOD. The uh, making up three quarters of uh, the uh, of funding goes for health insurance, but there are out-of-pocket uh, out-of-pocket expenses that patients have. Uh, this is uh, governmental public health. A small gray. If I can get my mouse to the small gray area is public health. Other third-party payers and investment. That's buildings, infrastructure, things like that. Where does it go? About a third, about a third, uh, about a third of the money goes for hospital expenses, about 20% for physician expenses, about 10% for prescription drugs. Uh, about 7% uh, uh, goes for other professional service, dentistry and other, uh, other non-physician providers. And then about 14% uh, uh, goes uh, to uh, other, which is a, a wide range of services. But about a third goes to hos for hospital care and about 20% for physicians. This is an editorial in CNN, two physicians, Gilbert Welch and Elliot Fisher, basically making the case that healthcare costs are really still out of control and uh, the individual spending on health care is uh, uh, in 2014 was $4,290, the average person who is making about $30,000 $30, a year. I, I got this this weekend, so I thought I would share it with you. Dear Ronald Stewart, uh, your uh, long-term care plan is increasing premiums by a small amount, 95.5%. But don't worry, it'll be phased in over two years. And you can drop your coverage if you want, but that's how it is. It's not sustainable. Not sustainable. This is from edit that editorial from CNN. I'll let you read it. Even though only 8%, only 8% of out-of-pocket expenses for the average person in the U.S., uh, the other 10% comes from uh, insurance payments and uh, lost wages and taxes. 18% of our, mine and your, income goes to fund health care. Now, it's not all bad, I will just say. I know I'm making a bad case for it, but it would be a whole nother grand rounds, but it's an interesting topic of discussion. Is this really as bad as people make it out to be? It's not as bad as people make it out to be because healthcare is a big driver of local economy. So, so it's not all bad. In fact, there are so many good things. And as we move into the age of, uh, you know, uh, automation, healthcare is one of the things that, uh, th that probably will be a vital component of local economies moving forward. So not all bad, but probably not sustainable at, uh, by increasing out of proportion to inflation. So why the disproportional increase? Uh, well, technology, for one. Technologic advances make up a lot of the increase in health care which is a good thing. It's, that's not a bad thing. The age distribution. We all know the U.S. and the Western economies are getting older, but in the U.S. we're getting older and younger. Th that the two biggest uh, groups increasing are elderly and young, and you can see that, or maybe you can't see based on this, but you can see that uh, 
that the biggest users of health care are the very young and really the, the elderly. In the middle, we don't use a lot of health care. On the two extremes, we use a lot of health care. So as we get older and younger, health care costs increase. There's no question that uh, my fellow baby boomers have led unhealthy lifestyles. Uh, that uh, although some things are significantly improved, mainly smoking, obesity, drug use, other risky behaviors, no question contribute to uh, out of control health care costs in the US. And there's no doubt that consumer demand and waste make up for a significant amount of uh, disproportionate increase in health care costs relative to inflation. The third problem, it's driven by problems one and two. If you cannot define your quality, someone is going to define it for you. There are lots of rating systems for physicians. None of them very good, happy to talk about them, but none of them are very good and the data is horrible. Even, it's much easier to grade big institutions than individuals, but this is the QRUR report from CMS. And basically, this is one of the tenets of healthcare reform, is to drive everybody to high quality, low cost quadrant. This is actually real data from the US, and this is one standard deviation minus one standard deviation, you can see. So, so there's two standard deviations. You can see this doesn't really hold up to st statistical rigor. Because in reality, if you were going to get to where there's really a difference, you would draw it two standard deviations or, or two and a half standard deviations on both sides of that line, and you can see that if you drew two standard deviations here and two standard deviations here, there's no one, there's no one in the high quality, low cost quadrant. Similarly, there, you can see that if you drew those standard deviations correctly, there's not a lot of difference between institutions. And if you don't define it, somebody else will define it, as the recent story on Representative Scalise has shown. This is, I said, well, I'll just go to Physician Compare and look up myself. Uh, you can see that right off the bat, they don't have my graduation year correct for medical school. They don't have my medical school correct. And they have no data on me but they do have data on the University of Texas Health Science Center, which is all based on primary care, all based on administrative claims data, which is not any good. That's how, as a consumer, I'm supposed to pick. Doesn't work. So I'm gonna work in US healthcare reform. I know it's politically uh, challenging to do, but uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about US healthcare reform is the current team in charge finding it healthcare reform more difficult than what we thought. So a little bit about the Affordable Care Act. This is from Bill Moyer's column in uh, early 2010, talking about the Affordable uh, Care Act and a couple of points that probably most people have forgotten. How did the Affordable Care Act and Patient Protection Act come to be? Everyone knows that President Obama's administration drove it. The Democrats uh, were in control. Uh, but how did the bill become flawed? It's, it's, cha it's challenged, it's flawed. Well, it started with 60 Democrats in the Senate, but a very unusual thing happened. Ted Kennedy died, and a Republican, Scott Brown, won the interim election in Massachusetts. An unusual thing. 
That meant that as the bill had passed the Senate and the House, now the Senate no longer had the votes. They could have, they could have changed the rules of the Senate, as was recently done, but they didn't. They didn't have the votes, so they made the decision to go with the Senate bill. <coughs> Three quarters of senators are probably running for president, and they have a different set of expertise than the House. They, they, they have a broad expertise, but they're not technical experts. For example, if you went to West Texas, the people who get elected to the House are all experts about oil and gas. They're much more experts about oil and gas than John Cornyn is. So, but they made the decision to go with the Senate bill. The math was wrong. There were many problems with it. And once they went with it, they've had to stick with it because there's been no bipartisan support enough to fix the bill. So, how are we where we are? Well, there's no question there's been a failure to work together to op optimally address the problem that we need to address. That means still there's no control and disproportionate increase in cost, probably going to be challenges with quality, and we do not have a health care system that's going to withstand the normal political cycles in the U.S. It's a problem for our children. So. I think most people know this. These are my seven P's to be. If you say what I think we should do, this is it. Be, part be participatory, be professional, be a problem solver, lead performance improvement, be passionate, patient, perseverant. I've bolded these first four because this is all about performance improvement. Obviously, number four is about performance improvement. But what are the challenges for us? What's the challenges for you? What's the challenges for you in that upper right quadrant there? Minimal, minimal, minimal surgical competence means that you have to largely master these domains. Fund of knowledge, technical skills, quality, professionalism, leadership, lifelong learning. Skill sets much more difficult now than whenever I was a resident. Now you can't just be a great technical open surgeon. You have to master several different technical skill sets. It's very difficult to do these things. While we're on these things, what things what things do you think surgeons value the most of this list? There's a hundred and so people here, so you're all going to have a different opinion, but what, what things surgeons traditionally view? Knowledge, Knowledge and skills. I agree with you. I think that's, that's what, that's, that's the traditional approach. Skills and knowledge, probably, in that order, probably. Uh, which, 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 was, which is good, but it's not enough to get you through today. In 15 years, the practice of surgery will be radically different than what it is today. You must have the ability to improve your performance over time. It's not enough to learn at once. It will all be different. The problems will be the same, the answers will be different. So which domain is most important? This is uh, Don Abedian from, uh, from the University of Michigan. He was the early leader in healthcare quality improvement. And these are his domains. Leadership is doing the right thing structure and process, doing things right. Outcomes are obviously getting the right results, but then add in safety, access, value, patient experience. What, what things do you think the patients think are most important? Our visiting speaker for the Al Society in June talked on the difference between patient, what the patient values and what we value. What do you think the average patients 
most important, they would view the most important of these domains. What do you think? Access safety? I think patient experience, personally. If you want to look at hospitals and know why they're so nice and why your clinics are so nice, uh, Chili's, okay, is that uh, uh, to have a good environment that looks good, is efficient, and you get a good experience, that's what people are looking for. The sophisticated patient is looking for that, that patient experience plus quality. The other thing that patients that, uh, having been a patient with a serious medical problem, I don't think uh, surgeons typically think it all the way through. For, for, from the patient point, I'll just say from as a knowledgeable patient, to me, safety was the most important thing. Not, not being harmed by, not coming out with something worse than what I went in in the beginning. But the truth is, all those domains are important. So probably most people in the audience recommend, recognize uh, Greg Popovich. John Wooden is down below him, two great basketball coaches. Uh, I think if you were to learn anything from them, you would learn that outcomes follow leadership structure and process. So if you have, if you have good processes, good structure, and good leadership, outcomes will follow. So philosophy is important. This comes from the very early days of the American College of Surgeons. John Bowman was the director of the ACS. He said some strange things. Philosophers rule the world. And the person of action may not know that this proposition is true, but it is besides the point. And then he goes on to say, what is your philosophy? What is our philosophy? If you read what he says in his final paragraph, he's, he's questioning those founders of the American College of Surgeons of what is their underlying philosophy, because that's going to drive the results. And I think he touches on what I think are the key, the key foundations of, of uh, medical surgical practice, character, service to the patient, and a commitment to science. So I was trying to think, getting ready for this talk, you know, is there, is there a golden rule of healthcare quality? There is, there is the golden rule, you know, treat people like you would want to be treated. If we all did that, the world would obviously be a better place. Uh, there's a golden rule of personal finance. Dr. Dent, what's the golden rule of personal finance? Don't you like it when you get picked pay up? First. Pay, pay yourself first. It's not what you save, it's what you earn. If you save 20% of your income and invest that for long-term growth, you can make almost, almost every financial mistake in the world and still survive. It is the golden rule of personal finance. So there are complicated things that can be summarized. I don't know what it is, but I'll just say it's not about having just a great education. It's not about having great innovation. We value those things in the US. Innovation, education, we value. It's not just about technical excellence. We value that too. It's not even just about having a great plan. It's about having a great plan and safely implementing that plan. And if you think about resident teams, if you think about your own teams, there are, plan, there are teams that have a great plan, but they're having a hard time implementing the plan. Well, that's a problem. There are teams that don't have a great plan. If you can't implement the plan, it's a big problem. Those are two bad things. But some people can have a mediocre plan and implement it really well, and the outcomes are really great. 
It's really about having a great plan and implementing that plan in a safe way. So what is your performance improvement philosophy? And the philosophy, I think, is the most important. At the foundation of performance improvement, and we owe a debt of gratitude in the modern world to the Japanese, to the Japanese who showed the world that they would transform manufacturing, in particular the automobile industry, with a few simple concepts. For the surgeon, though, we need to have a comprehensive, constructive, self-critical approach to patient care. That means that I look for opportunities for improvement. I don't look for reasons to say how great I am. I look for opportunities to improve. I'm not looking for opportunities to criticize and blame. I'm looking for opportunities to improve. That's what I'm looking for in myself. You would think there would be a bell-shaped curve. Non-critical on one side, destructively critical on the other. You'd think there'd be a bunch of people in the middle, but unfortunately, it's not natural for most people. I would say most young people come to a residency uh, as a bimodal distribution. They're either non-critical or destructively critical. Most of us get it wrong. Most of us get it wrong. So... At the core, if you were to ask me one of the most important skills for you to have, it is the ability to be constructively self-critical in all situations. But we have taught ourselves and we've taught you to be addicted to external feedback. Do you know what I mean by that? For the medical students, anybody know how to make a medical student really angry? Give them a C. An average grade. What would have been an average grade? But you're going to get a lot of angry people with the C. Because we've, it's not your fault. Reliance on external feedback limits people's ability to become their own best self-constructive critic. It requires a shift to me assuming responsibility and looking for my own self-improvement. And truthfully, in anything that we humans do, if you're honest with yourself, the person who always knows what, whether, how good a job they did is the person who's actually doing the work not some external observer. So comprehensive, constructive, self-critical <coughs> approach. Not destructively critical, not non-critical. So how to apply PI to PI? How to apply performance improvement to performance improvement? Actively look for opportunities for improvement. Consciously take responsibility. The first question to ask in any bad situation is what was my responsibility? Once you determine what your responsibility is, then you can start to think about what somebody else's responsibility is. But I find myself, I'm just going to say, every time I ask that question, I find that I'm responsible <laughs> almost every time. B non-destructive. That means a better way to phrase it would be be constructive. Do not make bad situations worse. Do not make bad situations worse with, worse with either bad behavior or a bad response. Address patient care and safety first and then comple comprehensively review the situation looking for opportunities for improvement. And how best to get those opportunities for improvement is actually for me to ask Dr. Jenkins openly, what, what, what should I have done differently? Because it may be hard for me, since I'm addicted to external feedback, it may be hard for me to know what I could have done differently. But there's no question that when you present to a group of your peers who are smart, uh, they figure out what I should have done differently. 
We need to focus on more than just education. The U.S. healthcare system looks like a bunch of biologist educators who were sort of interested in business, especially getting paid, develop the system. We need to develop risk-adjusted outcomes, and we need to build strong teams. So when you look at teams, this comes from three different sources. Google. Google spent a lot of time trying to figure out what made high-functioning teams. This is uh, Lencioni's pyramid, and this is John Wooden's pyramid. Three different totally independent approaches and I'm going to say at the foundation of a good team is trust and getting by the fear of conflict. Trusting each other, being trustworthy, being dependable, being able to trust somebody else, and getting by the fear of conflict. That's number one on Google's list. If you look at the, at the, at the base of Coach Wooden's pyramid, Friendship, loyalty, cooperation, enthusiasm, and work ethic. We must build good teams. So what's the college's approach to PI? It's very simple and it's very valuable. It's three or four, depending on how you break it, since it, break it down. I think it's easy to remember three. Set national, rigorous, but achievable standards. Those standards are aimed at the right structure, process, leadership, the right equipment. How are those standards developed? They're developed by you, a group of people like you, sitting in a room, discussing, rediscussing, discussing, rediscussing, discussing, arguing, debating, Tearing it apart, building it back up, discussion about what should those standards be. That's called experts talking about what they believe is the right thing to do. Second thing, data quality matters. I talked about it in the beginning. Data quality matters. Why does it matter so much for you, for me? Because if the data quality is horrible, you're never going to believe it. Even if the conclusions are correct, we're not going to believe it. Data quality matters. So using risk-adjusted clinical information is important. And the third principle of the college's program is trust but verify. That you must be visited by a team of peers and experts every three years who are going to check all of your assumptions, set standards, use risk-adjusted outcomes, and verify. These have been very successful programs for the American College of Surgeons. As I said, they were developed by a group, a multidisciplinary team of experts, and the Committee on Trauma. What's the Committee on Trauma's model, which is at the foundation of the college's approach? ATLS came about in 1976, so did Trauma Center Standards. Why was ATLS so important? Because it set one simple way for how to do things. The trauma center standards, I've talked about setting standards, and then a verification program to, to, to see whether people meet those standards or not. TQIP was the last development. Trying to measure outcome is difficult in healthcare. It's difficult because because taking care of patients is not, like, is not just like building a car where you start with very homogenous, same components that you can engineer precisely. Patients come in a wide variety of sizes, shapes, and problems. So you need risk-adjusted outcomes. So we've applied, uh, it's Dr. Jenkins in the middle there, an automobile analogy to surgical quality which if you think about the standards, that's, that's design, manufacturing, maintenance. But how do you really drive those standards? Will you drive that in a local hospital or group of physicians with the performance improvement and patient safety program? That's how the quality really gets implemented. And then TQIP 
or the, the risk adjusted outcome is essentially your dashboard. So you have design, drivetrain, dashboard. The outcomes have been remarkable. Significant improvements in outcome in the past 20 years by applying that approach. So I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to first go back to health care reform. What do we need to do regardless of your political opinion long term? I don't mean to shake my head because it's not the most optimistic just listening to the discussion. But in reality, the U.S. needs bipartisan political solutions that are sustainable regardless of whether a Democrat or Republican is in office. The goal should be to improve quality and reduce costs to sustainable long-term levels. But we're not in long-term, we're in medium-term, short-term. What can we do, what can you and I do what can we do here? Well, the one thing we can do is we can improve surgical specialty-based healthcare quality. If we improve quality by improving our performance and we reduce complications, we will improve outcomes and we will reduce cost. That's what we can do. For our primary care colleagues and for us, getting the right patient in the right place for the right care is important. Today, a single mom with a sick child at 6 p.m. has only one place to go to the emergency department where they're going to get a $3,000 bill when they could have gotten a $30 bill or maybe a $300 bill. Two, three orders of magnitude difference. Corporations have realized and starting to realize that actually wellness does really matter. Not trying to turn us on to marathon runners, but if we ate better, moved more, we're in a little bit better shape, healthcare costs would be significantly less. And we're going to have to deal with end of life care. 5% of patients account for more than 50% of the cost. So how to improve surgical quality? Well, there have been dramatic improvements. There's no question though, you in this, you in this room are critical because your leadership and advocacy are key. There's no way that I'm gonna be able to force any of you to do anything that you don't wanna do. I talked about the ACS approach uh, and I talked about how it came to be. So your leadership is key. And the way to do that is to work to improve patient care by building consensus from you in this room for doing the right thing for the patient. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Yep. 